So we're here to discuss the broad concept around safety for creation. We're, trying, we're here broadly here to discuss the safety of fecal microbiota transplantation and figuring out who do we decide are the best possible donors and what's the system in place to ensure that this really exciting technology and treatment actually gets the people that are needed, but do it in the best and safest way possible. So I think it's a couple things. So it's a, to find the hardest part is figuring out the donors. We're trying to find the, the Olympic athletes of poop, uh, the, the super donors. Uh, and, uh, and that's actually hard. You, you would think that poop's everywhere, but it's actually hard. It's really hard to find good poop. Um, and so it's, there's a kind of a three-step approach. The, the first point is uh, donors fill in an online registry um, to figure out kind of common reasons for why you'd be excluded. For us, it would be kind of time commitment and logistics around if you live in Brazil, you're probably not a good candidate to, to be a poop donor in Boston. Um, and a number of health, common health, health issues. And that usually screens out close to about 65% uh, of folk. Um, the, the, next, the next part that we look at is a 109 point clinical assessment looking for a number of infectious diseases as well as many diseases that we think are linked to the microbiome. Everything that we can potentially cure, we can potentially cause. And so we're very, very thorough in assessing that. And, um, donors, potential donors spend a lot of time uh, with us uh, assessing that and um, a 45 minute assessment uh, including a BMI, which is a body mass index, as well as a weight circumference. And, they, and only about 35% of individuals are able to pa pass that stage. Then the next part happens is, is really, really tricky is, is they go through a laboratory assessment, both stool and blood tests for infections, uh, predominantly 30, 30 of them, and, uh, and only, uh, only something 24% are able to pass through that stage. And you kind of cut all the data up and you boil it all down, roughly about 4.1% of individuals are actually able to pass through this very, very rigorous um, uh, screening step. And uh, the reality is that it's much easier to get into Oxford or, or, or Harvard than it is to actually be a, be a stool donor. So they pass that first screen and they donate for 60 days, okay? And each time um, during that time, during that time period, they can have random spot checks, kind of like if they're a blood doper, in case there's any health changes. Each sample gets assessed for quality uh, on a Bristol school, stool scale and pathology and an individual assessment at each donation. So we're very rigorous during that donation process. But the poop doesn't go anywhere. It stays in the freezer, it stays in quarantine. Then the exact same rigorous standards that we did at the beginning, the clinical assessment, 45 minutes with a doctor and a nurse, um, a uh, 30 blood and stool tests are also conducted. Only if they pass both bookends does the material in the middle get released to, to patients. Um, and so it's, that's the, the next model of, of moving forward in safety is to have double testing, rigorous testing, and also to keep every single sample that goes out the door is traceable. It's barcoded so we can trace if there's ever, heaven forbid, an adverse event. And also a sample is taken in case we can trace back to that exact sample that went into that patient. And so that's something we think is trying to improve the safety aspects of this new and emerging, emerging space. I've been really, really lucky to have a, a lot of media attention that's drawn interest in this space and catalyzed interest in the mission. We're a nonprofit. It's very different than uh, other groups. We're you know, like the Red Cross, but for poop, we're kind of like the Brown Cross. Uh, and so, uh, you know, patients are, uh, donors are particularly motivated by our mission.